Was it a real flesh and blood animal? Of course. I told him that my suspicions had been roused because of the easiness of the total event. It was as if the lion had been waiting out there and had been trained to do exactly what Don Juan had planned. He was unruffled by my barrage of skeptical remarks. He laughed at me. You're a funny fellow. You saw and heard the cat. It was right under the tree where you were. He didn't smell you and jump at you because of the river willows. They kill any other smell, even for cats. You had a batch of them in your lap. I said that it wasn't that I doubted him, but that everything that happened that night was extremely foreign to the events of my everyday life. For a while, as I was taking my notes, I even had the feeling that Don Juan may have been playing the role of the lion. However, I had to discard the idea, because I had really seen the dark shape of a four-legged animal charging at the cage and then leaping to the mesa. Why do you make such a fuss? It was just a big cat. There must be thousands of cats in those mountains. Big deal. As usual, you're focusing your attention on the wrong item. It makes no difference whatsoever whether it was a lion or my pants. Your feelings at the moment were what counted. In my entire life, I have never seen or heard a big wildcat on the prowl. When I thought of it, I could not get over the fact that I had been only a few feet away from one. Why the all for the big cat? You've been close to most of the animals that live around here, and you've never been so awed by them. Do you like cats? No, I don't. Well, forget about it then. The lesson was not on how to hunt cats anyway. What was it about? The little crow pointed out that specific spot to me, and at that spot I saw the opportunity of making you understand how one acts while one is in the mood of a warrior. Everything you did last night was done within a proper mood. You were controlled, and at the same time abandoned when you jumped down from the tree to pick up the cage and run to me. You were not paralyzed with fear. And then, near the top of the bluff, when the cat let out that scream, you moved very well. I'm sure you wouldn't believe what you did if you looked at that bluff during the daytime. You had a degree of abandon and at the same time, you had a degree of control over yourself. You did not let go and wet your pants, and yet you let go and climbed that wall in complete darkness. You could have missed that trail and killed yourself. To climb that wall in darkness required that you had to hold on to yourself and, at the same time, let go of yourself. That's what I call the mood of a warrior. I said that whatever I had done that night was a product of my fear and not the result of any mood of control or abandon. I know that, he said smiling, and I wanted to show you that you can spur yourself beyond your limits if you're in the proper mood. A warrior makes his own mood. You didn't know that. Fear got you into the mood of a warrior, but now you know about it, anything can serve to get you into it. One needs the mood of a warrior for every single act. Otherwise, one becomes distorted and ugly. There is no power in a life that lacks this mood. Look at yourself. Everything offends and upsets you. You whine and complain and feel like everyone is making you dance to their tune. You're a leaf at the mercy of the wind. There is no power in your life. What an ugly feeling that must be. A warrior, on the other hand, is a hunter. He calculates everything. That's control. But once his calculations are over, he acts. He lets go. That's abandon. A warrior is not a leaf at the mercy of the wind. No one can push him. No one can make him do things against himself or against his better judgment. A warrior is tuned to survive, and he survives in the best of all possible fashions. I liked his stance, although I thought it was unrealistic. It seemed too simplistic for the complex world we live in. He laughed at my arguments and I insisted that the mood of a warrior could not possibly help me overcome the feeling of being offended or actually being injured by the actions of my fellow men, as in the hypothetical case of being physically harassed by a cruel and malicious person placed in a position of authority. A warrior could be injured, but not offended. For a warrior, there is nothing offensive about the acts of his fellow men as long as he himself is acting within the proper mood. The other night, you are not offended by the big cat. The fact that it chased us did not anger you. I did not hear you cursing it, nor did I hear you say that he had no right to follow us. It could have been a cruel and malicious cat for all you know. 
but that was not a consideration why you struggled to avoid it. The only thing that was pertinent was to survive, and that you did very well. If you would have been alone and the cat had caught up with you and mauled you to death, you would have never considered complaining or feeling offended by its acts. The mood of a warrior is not so far-fetched for yours or anybody else's world. You need it in order to cut through the crap. I explained my way of reasoning. The big cat and my fellow men were not at par, because I knew the intimate quirks of men while I knew nothing about the cat. What offended me about my fellow men was that they acted maliciously and knowingly. To achieve the mood of a warrior is not a simple matter. It's a revolution. To regard the cat and her fellow men as equals is a magnificent act of the warrior's spirit. It takes power to do that.